What's the reasoning behind assuming that a model that fits better is better? Right. Um, that's a great question. So um, a model that fits the training data better is not better, actually. And if you look at what the um, uh, fundamentally, and I have like a whole talk about this, what this Bayesian evidence calculation does is it trades off the fit to the data with the complexity of the model in a currency that if you're a computer scientist, you can translate it directly into bits. Okay, so really what it's looking at is the overall complexity of the um, explanation given by the model and the residual that's not being explained left in the data. And it's basically the only principled way I've ever seen to do this apart from empirical methods like cross-validation and so on, which I think are very robust and great ideas as well. Arthur? Um. Hi, Zubin. Uh, so uh, I have a question about the automated statistician. So you have some nice interpretable uh, examples where the input is one-dimensional and there is an output. Now, if you have multi-dimensional inputs and the interactions between those inputs might affect the output, the complexity of explaining these effects might increase a lot. So have you thought about how to automate that in a way that's easily interpretable? Um, thanks, Arthur. You're allowing me to plug the fact that I always show the time series stuff, but we have done a whole bunch of other things. So had I had more time, which I don't, um, I would have also shown you examples of the automatic statistician for classification, which runs on a small number of input dimensions and produces a report that tells you which input variables are important and which ones are not. Um, what we haven't figured out is how do we scale up explanations um, when you're trying to predict something from, say, a thousand input variables. I mean, I think it's, it's pretty sensible how to do it. You could just say, um, you gave me a thousand input variables. Um, I made my best uh, you know, choices for trying to predict. Here are the top five most important variables. I mean, that's how we're going to do it, but we haven't done it yet. The other problem is not just the explanations, but how do you scale up the search uh, when you have a thousand variables? What we're doing is you know, uh, picking variables, entering them, and deleting them, um, like stepwise selection type methods. But if you have many, many variables, you need to do it all in parallel. I mean, perhaps also the interaction as well is interactions uh, are, yeah. important to explain. Not the, just the classification one does interactions as well. I'll uh, show you in the break if you want. Hi, Tom Dietrich. Uh, I'm on the organizing committee. Um, so I want to point out, it was probably obvious to the audience, but there's quite a tension in the machine learning community between what we might call the neats and the scruffies. So the deep learning uh, researchers would say that they are not merely doing function approximation, but that they themselves have developed a new way of programming computers that they might call differentiable software engineering. Right, in which it's true that they don't need to know how to compute the derivatives of their networks because that's now automated. But they do know that they are designing programs that will be differentiable end to end so that they can train them. And they may include memory cells and many other intermediate structures, not merely feed forward uh, models. Another claim, though, that I would say the scruffy side of the world uh, makes is that their methods are more robust to model misspecification. So um, this is an area where I think there's a lot of interesting theory to be done. What can you tell us about the, I mean, obviously the Bayesian strategy is to make explicit as much of our uncertainty as we can. And so it's, it's sort of ultimate known unknowns approach. Um, what can you tell us about uh, robustness to the unmodeled uh, problems in, in a domain? Yeah, that's a great question. It's true that the, um, so I, I agree with you that uh, a lot of kind of modern deep learning thinking um, is around, um, you know, trying to build these differentiable architectures that do everything, you know, end to end, um, uh, including using memory and so on. Um, most of the applications are still these feed forward things, and I think that a lot of that is kind of the, the current research thinking, although those types of ideas were around a long time ago as well, and they're just being revived. Um, your second point is also very good. Um, in terms of robustness, there's a limit to how much you can believe the Bayesian um, 
framework because basically it's always conditional on the initial beliefs that you put in. So any estimates of uncertainty have to be taken with that grain of salt. It's the known unknowns, as you say. Um, that's why I actually, you know, I, I wouldn't throw away cross-validation <laughs> as a very good idea. You should always, you know, from the pure Bayesian framework, there's no reason to leave out some test data. But actually, I think that's too much of a fundamentalist view. And really, the world is too complicated to model anyway. And so um, we should always stress test our models in new environments. Yeah. Okay, we're stealing um, time from the coffee break, so the, the, uh, the lady had a question, or you changed your mind? No, I didn't. Okay. Actually, you just answered part of my question, but I'm going to just push gently on the issue of black box, transparency, et cetera. We hear that language a lot, but I just don't believe it. I just don't. I think we're beyond the black box now. So I want to talk to you and, and get you to talk about that a little bit. You talked about a principled method of evaluating models, but not so much cross-validation, which is interesting. But so when, when you're making a probabilistic trade-off, how, how can one know what tweaks are the best tweaks? What is generalizable here? What can we say are the best practices around what a computer scientist might want to tweak or not tweak? Where are the ethics of those decision makings in that tension point? It's a really difficult question. To me, it's not so much a black box. It's, a, it's minute decisions that make really big differences in the long term and the long tail. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's, it's difficult to know Yeah, the, the, the many strands to your question. I'm going to look at the interpretability side. Um, uh, I think that really interpretability is important depending on the application. Um, some, for some, it's incredibly important. For some, it's less important. Um, but it's been under uh, studied as a topic in machine learning as an academic field. And so part of the reason this is coming up a lot now is that um, those minute decisions that you talk about, because they might happen in the real world um, and they can have an impact on us as humans, we need to be very careful to be able to unpack them. And I think, you know, in some ways, at some point, we might need to just be pragmatic. Like, if the self-driving cars can pass, pass a, um, a driving test, practical driving test that's 100 times longer than a human's and ace it, then we should just give it the license, right? And that's just a pragmatic solution. We might not be able to understand it. Maybe when it does have a crash or when we want to update it, we need to be able to debug it. But in terms of allowing them to drive on the, on the streets, we may need to just be pragmatic. Hi, um, Rao Kamupadi. So I just first of all want to point out that with all these worries about the technological unemployment, I'm just heartened that you are making an automated statistician that will also remove data scientists from job market. I think the current administration will be very happy. Um, one question that I had, I mean, for, for some of us you know, uh, in AI, but not uh, directly in machine learning, this idea of how probabilistic machine learning has suddenly become the good old-fashioned AI in a pejorative <laughs> sense has been uh, quite fascinating. Um, despite what you say, and I, you know, you're preaching to the choir when I teach my students, I teach some of your slides, there's the same sort of an idea that Bayesian learning is what we would like to do. But it's clearly the case that the Googles, the Facebooks, the, all the main labs, except the one that you and Gary Marcus started, are deep learning shops. So the question that I would like to, he, you know, that I'd like to see you answer is, what would you say is like a great example currently that's available that shows that the same sort of performance that's available from deep learning systems can be actually handled and improved with uh, you know probabilistic techniques and, and Bayesian techniques. Not, not the small ones, but the ones that will work directly on you know, like the Google car or something of that kind. And that I think will bring us back as again as just saying, you guys are all wrong, one day you'll realize, which is what various Camps in AI always keep saying to other camps. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, 
uh, I think that the the deep learning community has definitely taken taken the higher ground in terms of uh, you know the the perceptual applications and that clearly there's uh, there's no um, question there. Um, for one thing I'd like to say is that uh, these are not incompatible in that um, there's in my world there are two categories there's models and algorithms deep learning is actually lives in the space of models mostly the algorithm is trivial right Bayesian methods is about algorithms and and you can actually mi mix and match models and algorithms you can do Bayesian deep learning or you can do you know um, whatever convex optimization for a different model etc um, uh, but to answer the question about applications I think that um, the applications uh, if you look at sort of a lot of the applied problems in industry, things like you know um, predicting uh, click rates or recommender systems, or um, you know, for example, at Uber we're thinking about some spatiotemporal prediction problems and so on. Um, they're not actually obviously things that you would throw into deep learning architectures. And sort of uh, you know what we need is is uh, hybrid approaches that use, I, I'm happy to have a little deep learning component inside of something if it's going to do good function approximation from large amounts of data. Um, but you know what we need is hybrid architectures that can uh, make predictions with uncertainty um, where that matters. Um, I don't know, I, I think there are uh, examples of that kind um, that are not sort of the fancy uh, um, perceptual like speech recognition, computer vision. Okay, so uh, with that ecumenical remark, uh, let's add, uh, end the session before uh, coffee. There'll be a little bit shorter coffee, and let's thank Zubin and all our speakers again.